Thank you very much, Dean. It's wonderful to be here among friends, uh, fellow classmates, staff, volunteers. I'm very glad to be here. Um, Dean Rutherford did not mention, but we are very proud because he was part of the visionary team that conceptualized and developed and created the Central High Museum, Inc., the nonprofit that later became or was converted into a National Historic Site. So he was there from the beginning, from laying the groundwork, and then was instrumental also in developing and working towards getting it designated as a National Historic Site. So thank you very much. Every day, I'm very proud to be a park ranger. But today, I am especially proud because I am standing on the shoulders of some amazing women who blazed a path for me. And today, we celebrate the women of the National Park Service to commemorate Women's History Month. And it's wonderful that you all have blazed the trail for someone like me and women across the agency to, to work in a career path that we are truly passionate about. So before I introduce our main speaker, I would like to introduce you to three wonderful superintendents of parks here in Arkansas. Robin White, superintendent of Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. Laura Miller, superintendent of the President Clinton Birthplace National Historic Site. And Josie Fernandez, superintendent of Hot Springs National Park. And after our presentation, they will have the opportunity to engage and tell you about their wonderful, fruitful careers. But to begin tonight's presentation, I would like to introduce you to Polly Welts Kaufman. Kaufman is the author of National Parks and the Women's Voice, and also wrote a 2009 op-ed article in the Portland, Maine Press Herald, critiquing Ken Burns' public television documentary, National Parks, America's Best Idea, for its noticeable absence of recognition regarding women's contributions to national parks. Kaufman is a Fulbright scholar and a history instructor at the University of Southern Maine. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Polly Kaufman. Thank you very much. I'm going to move right along because I have so many pictures I want to show you. And uh, these are historic pictures that uh, I've collected over time, and I think that you will get a new perception about women and what they had to do in order to become in the national parks. In 1900, when sportswomen Kitty Tatch and Catherine Hazelton were not dancing for joy, they worked as waitresses at Yosemite's hotels. That was the only way they could be at Yosemite. This is overhanging rock at Glacier Point. About the same time, women were welcomed by the new mountaineering clubs the Sierra Club and the Mountaineers. Here the women members join male colleagues to climb Mount Seattle in the Olympics in 1913. This is the cover of my book. And when my editor suggested it as a cover, I said, just a minute. And I counted to make sure there were more women than men. And then I said, OK. <laughs> Whoops, too fast. Uh, in August 1890, Faye Fuller, Fuller became the first white woman, and I say white woman because we don't know if Native American women did this, uh, to climb Mount Rainier. She wore a thick blue flannel bloomer, bloomer suit and rolled her positions in a blanket, but she wanted to make sure people knew she was a woman, and so she topped off her outfit with a ribboned straw hat. In 1917, Elizabeth Burnell, <coughs> who was the first woman to be licensed as a nature guide in Rocky Mountain by the Park Service, uh, <coughs> the thing that was interesting was that the Park Service wouldn't let her climb uh, Long's Peak under their uh, program, so that she had to do it as a nature guide for another organization, and she climbed it maybe twice a week. This is Jewel Cave, and it's in your region. Uh, Jan Kahn and her husband mapped out nearly 70 miles of passages in Jewel Cave in the Black Hills of South Dakota, making it the second 
to Mammoth Cave. And the way you get to be the longest cave is to make more paths. And so they did that. The, uh, I think I've, just, just go back one, right. A, <clears throat> this is John Muir over on the left. John Muir was kind of a ladies man. He knew that if he wanted to get things done, he had to involve the women. He was trying really hard not to have Yosemite's Hetch Hetchy Valley dammed uh, as a reservoir for San Francisco. And he got the women of the Sierra Club, the California Federation of Women, to even go to Washington to testify for it. He did lose, but he got the women so interested that they actually helped get the National Park Service itself a past and we're about to have the, is it the centennial? Whatever is coming up soon of the Park Service. This is probably my favorite and this is what that article, that, that angry op-ed piece is all about. Uh, there, this is Minerva Hamilton Hoyt and she founded Joshua Tree National Monument. She was tireless. Uh, she had to convince the world, really, that cactus were important. And uh, she would camp out in, in what became Joshua Tree. She sent cactus exhibits to England, to uh, the Horticultural Society in Boston, did everything she could to try and convince people that deserts were important, the desert habitat was important. Finally, uh, she got enough courage, and so in 1930, uh, it was no, a little later than that, sometime in the 30s, uh, she uh, camped on the, on the steps of the White House until um, Roosevelt would see her. And Harold Ickes escorted her in. The, the, it took about two minutes because Roosevelt looked at her and he said, Ickes is for this, so I'm for it and he made a national monument. Now it's become a national park because of the efforts of Diane Feinstein. Uh, so it's uh, really an amazing place. And they sell my book there because I'm the only person that tells how great she is. <laughs> the, uh, let's see, I've, I've also jumped too fast. Here we go. Uh, this is the Frederick Douglass home and it was a long drive by the National Association of Colored Women to get this saved by the Park Service and it's just been reopened and uh, from being rehabbed. This is Gladys Parham, who was a member of the National Association of Colored Women. Uh, she was a, a, worked in the Federal Service, but she spent, she lived in the, in the house in order to save it. An interesting thing about this park is, is that when I went to it, um, they had recently uh, curated the books. And when they opened the pages of the books, they found letters. And what Douglas did was he took the letters from people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and put them inside their book, the book that they wrote. So they went through the park and found that his filing system was quite interesting. I'll try to get one at a time. You probably know who this is. This is Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, who was the great champion of the Everglades. She wrote a book on the Everglades and uh, really was after, she was a little tiny woman. I actually saw her speak. You could practically not see her. She was so tiny. And she didn't die. She didn't die and she didn't die until she died when she was 106. <laughs> This is probably one of the most important women. Uh, the Alaska, Alaska, the people in Alaska, the citizens of Alaska were not very excited about the Alaska Lands Bill, which was finally completed in 1980 and doubled the physical size of the Park Service. And Celia Hunter, who recently died of Fairbanks, uh, got herself made a president of the Wilderness Society. And she used that to focus the national support on Alaska and the Alaska Lands Bill. And it finally got passed. A Carter signed it just before he left office. They haven't had another woman 
president of the wilderness society so maybe we need to work on that this is josie's park this is women's rights national historical park in seneca falls dedicated in one nine hundred eighty two and developed by women superintendents from Judy Hart and Josie Fernandez. And uh, it, it uh, is the park that talks about the July 1848 Women's Rights Convention that started the really, the, the formal women's movement and, and Frederick Douglass was there. For more than a, a decade, no, here we are back, this is Boss Pinkley, okay. Uh, this is Upaki National Park, and the uh, uh, Courtney, Courtney and David Jones. And what happened in, in, the, in the Southwest Parks was they had one man who was the so-called superintendent of the park. Uh, they called them custodians. And the man had a wife, and so, the, usually had a wife, uh, always had a wife, actually. And Boss Pinkley knew that he was getting those free services. So he called them HCWP, which meant Honorary Custodians Without Pay. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Yosemite, and this is where the Park families lived. And if you look closely, you can see the little boy uh, be between the two of them peeking over. And those are her wash tubs. And there's, there's his ranger hat up there. This is Harold Bryant, who eventually became chief naturalist of the Park Service. Now we have the bad story. When Horace Albright was superintendent at Yellowstone, he became really impressed with women's abilities, especially as interpreters, as ranger naturalists. This is Herma Albertson at Yellowstone. And so he hired some of them. And I just went too fast again. No. Well, the, uh, uh, let's see if I can get that other one. Well, let me see if it did it out of order. There it is. Okay. They wore the same uniform as men. And you can tell which one is Herma Albertson, I think. But you notice that she even has her coat buttoned the same way that men do, you know, it's been a tradition that we button our coats differently. Uh, so when the Inspector General of the Department of Interior came to, to Yellowstone and he saw women on horseback, women rangers, four or five of them, he was shocked. And he told Horace Albright that he had to stop using uh, women for those positions. And why didn't he use those, that man over there in the corner who was on a horse? Uh, and Horace Albright said to him, I keep that man in the furthest reaches of the park because uh, he can't speak to, to the public. But they, we did, they did lose it. Lose, the women did use, lose that position. And so what happened was uh, women, they married rangers, married superintendents. They kind of had to go underground. They didn't have any support from the ranger naturalists who were men because they had been teased uh, by the uh, rangers that came from the U.S. Cavalry uh, as pansy pushers and tree huggers. So this is what happened. Uh, in the early 60s, some of the park rangers who were in historic houses said they didn't think that guiding in a historic house was professional work and so some superintendents said, well, let's use women for that. And some of them remembered back when there were women rangers. And so the big problem was what would the women wear? And so they went to the United Nations, they went to the airlines, and decided that a pillbox hat and high heels was just right for these new positions. This is at Independence. This woman is at uh, Oak Creek Canyon, and she actually is the supervisor of these, these men who were seasonals. She doesn't have a full-size patch. She has a little pin. She has to wear that pillbox hat and look cute. Well, it turns out that this is significant. When I was doing my interviewing of women, I wondered why they kept talking about uniforms. 
I thought, oh my God, here's another one that's talking about uniforms. And then I realized that the struggle to get an equal uniform for women paralleled the struggle for women to get equity in jobs in the Park Service. This is another one. This is Carlsbad Caverns. She's a nurse. They had to have nurses go down with them there, or they thought they did. Then, the crowning blow. A lot of male supervisors, a lot of women, really minded that, that uh, original uniform. And so they hired a company to uh, make this, to create uniforms, including pop-up aprons and all kinds of stuff. Polyester, the uh, Stetson even had cardboard around the brim. And they thought this was going to solve the problem, the state of the art. Then it got worse. Then <laughs> came the bicentennial. And these are interpreters at Union Station. Uh, and they called it the McDonald's uniform. <laughs> Finally, the gray and green set and tie, full-size badge and patch were achieved here worn, worn by two interpreters at Acadia. You'll never find her, but there's a woman there. The uh, women were beginning to enter the ranks as rangers, but becoming a park superintendent took a lot longer. Uh, this is 1965, and I don't know, but can any of you find the woman? Right. It happens to be Wilhelmina Harris at Adams, and she actually came with the park, so the park service had to take her. They didn't have any choice. When I published my new edition of the book, uh, which was about five years ago, about a quarter of the superintendents were women, in places even like Yellowstone, my recent research, which is not as, quite as definitive, shows that there has not been a lot of change in the last five years. This is Tommy Patrick Lee, the former superintendent of Glacier Bay, and I use her as an example of a superintendent because uh, she's a, a ranger's ranger. She is the first woman, and one of the few women, to be awarded the service-wide Harry Yount Award and she was awarded it while serving as a chief ranger at Glen Canyon. Her husband actually was killed on duty, and uh, she came and took over. Uh, the Midwest region has grown women leaders. This is Lorraine Mintzmeyer, and I don't know if any of you remember her, but she was a product of the Midwest region. She was, went through a lot of administrative positions, very smart woman, and she became the first woman regional director. And I've just noticed that Peggy O'Dell has recently been appointed deputy director of the Park Service, uh, which is, to me, practically the most important job in the Park Service. And uh, she started off in college at the Arch, and then she married and had her children, and then she went back to the, which is, I've seen this happen uh, before, then she went back uh, to the Park Service and just took off. Uh, she became the uh, uh, head of the National Capital Region, and she was the one who was in charge of the inauguration. Diversity is really important in the Park Service. It hasn't progressed as fast as most of us would like, but it's there, and I hope will continue. Uh, this is Virginia Salazar who was a, is a member of the Santa Clara Pueblo, and she was a long time curator in the Western region and brought special insights in the interpretation of artifacts. Diversity is also demonstrated through the establishment of new parks. And here, citizen activist Sue Cunatomi Embry, who was interred as a child in Manzanar, speaks at the opening of that park that honors Japanese Americans who were forced to leave their homes to live in the camps. Her story is quite interesting. Uh, like the survivors of the Holocaust, she didn't tell anybody that she had been interred in a camp. She wanted to just live normally once they got back. Uh, she went to college as an older woman, and they were interviewing each other. And so she all of a sudden found herself telling her story. And from that, she and another woman 
decided they would do something about it. It was the Reagan administration, and the first thing they did was to say, we want reparations. And so it was under Ronald Reagan's administration that each survivor of a, a internment camp uh, got $20,000. Then they decided to start Manzanar, which uh, is now a national park. And there's another one, uh, another one of the camps that I think is be being used as a national site. And of course, the diversity that I saw today at Little Rock, I was so, so impressed with your park, the exhibits, and uh, I was very moved. I was moved to tears a couple of times. And then having the interpretation uh, and having me have to walk in that girl's footsteps uh, was uh, very, very touching. And I really feel honored to have been there. This is a great gal, Althea Robertson. Uh, she was probably the first black woman ranger at Yosemite. And so what she does, she's got a lot of personality. And I use this as my frontispiece. And I was there when she opened the book and screamed, oh my god. <laughs> she was really impressed. Uh, I like the picture because she's honoring the next generation by letting her wear her Stetson without anybody saying she couldn't do it. And I also like her uh, because what she decided to do at Yosemite was to honor the African-American cavalry that really kept Yosemite uh, before the Park Service took it over. Um, it also is another sobering thought, and that is that the number of park rangers is pretty much the same as it was five years ago. The, uh, it is uh, a, a third of the number of rangers. You don't feel that when you're in this park because you've got loads of women, but it is. And part of the reason is because I was told, but it doesn't, isn't true here, that Homeland Security requires a uh, person to a uh, law enforcement ranger to be in each park. And uh, we know that women go into law enforcement. We have a lot of, a uh, lot, lot of, uh, I know you're shaking your head. I've, that's what I heard here. Uh, but I did find, hear that in Washington anyway. Uh, so that if you have to have one law enforcement ranger in the park, it cuts down on the number of interpreters. The first woman park service director was Fran Manella who served from 2001 to 2009. And I think one of, the things, one of the things that is her legacy was that she worked really hard, hard to forge Park Service partnerships, uh, partnerships with the Park Service and the broader community, and that has continued. Uh, her work was, was followed by Mary Bomar, who was the second director, but she only stayed a couple years, and she continued to work on partnerships. Now, Charlie thinks that women have gone too far. He thinks that they've taken that lovely, that's at Yosemite, that wonderful cut of the redwood tree. And they, the, the women rangers have changed it. They have only women events on the uh, park. And so he's, he's really worried that this, and look at her, she's really scary. <laughs> So I think his, wor his worries have been confirmed because in Alaska, uh, Sue Massica is the fairly new regional director, but Marsha Blazak was there before. And of course, Alaska is every, every green-blooded man's the goal to serve there at least some of the time. And here they've had to work under women for, you know, 15 years. And uh, also, we have the... Uh, uh, the deputy is now Peggy O'Dell, and you have to really pay attention to her. So I think that it's quite interesting that we have some very talented women in the top positions. Among the new parks honoring women is Rosie the Riveter in Richmond, California. I visited that fairly recently. And Judy Hart, who was the woman who helped found women's rights, is the one who developed this. Uh, she stayed in the Park Service long enough to help establish it. It's in Richmond, California, a very interesting park. The, uh, 
And now I'm going to give you a job. We've got to, this is here in uh, uh, Little Rock. We've got to do something about this Harriet Tubman uh, standoff. Uh, on February 1st, uh, Senator Benjamin Cardin and Barbara Mikowski int finally introduced legislation uh, for two connected parks, the eastern shore of Maryland, which would be the site of the Tubman Underground Railroad, and Auburn, New York, but these would be connected parks, where she ran a home for elderly African Americans and worked for women's suffrage. Uh, there's work to be done, and it's been in the offing for probably 10 years and it's really time to make it happen. Okay. Do we take questions now? Yeah. Or later? Want, want them to speak? Okay, okay, right. Probably if you just wanna get on stage and sit with them right next to Josie, that'd be great. We got a chair for you up there. Judge, you can, I guess, start on that end and kind of go. In, so I get to set the pace. Um, um, I, I've been a superintendent now for in, at three different parks. Um, I've been with the National Park Service since 1993 and I have had a wonderful um, honors and opportunities to serve. Um, I suppose that my experience could be said that is quite different than my colleagues here because um, my career started with the um, United States Air Force. So wearing uniforms that uh, were fitting well and, um, and uh, having the opportunity to serve equally with my male colleagues has always been part of my experience in service to my country. So I obviously did not experience many of the things that Polly was uh, mentioning. Um, or maybe I did and I didn't know it because I'm too stubborn enough to be allowed to, to be put in my place by, um, by people who want to put me in my place. So I'll just leave it at that for now and then we'll just uh, have a, the, the rest of the conversation. <laughs> Okay, we're going in order. Um, well, I've been a superintendent now for two months. <laughs> Thank you. It's been great so far. Um, but we actually had a, a guest speaker, a, a visitor from uh, the National Park Service from our Washington office at Central High last week, and he said something that really made me think about this upcoming program. He uh, is African American, and he was talking about the organization as a whole. And when people ask, you know, what does the organization like to work for, he said, you can say everything good about it, and then you can say bad things about it. Is it a racist organization? Yes and no. And I got to thinking, you can say the same thing about women's experience in the Park Service as well, because in my time in the Park Service, I've been with the Park Service for 10 years now, this month, by the way. And um, I have both experienced an environment that is welcoming and supportive and has been absolutely wonderful to me in my career. I've had superintendents who have uh, guided me and helped me through. And I've also experienced sexual harassment. And, um, you know, it's so hard to believe these days. I actually had to think twice about it. Was, was that, did he really say that? <laughs> There wasn't really anything egregious. It was really just sophomoric and really high on the ew factor. <laughs> But, um, you know, you, you experience it all because it, at the top levels, um, I think we have an organization that, that is set up to be supportive and is set up designed to help people succeed, but it plays out in 390 some odd different ways on a very local level at each park. And I, I have a story on your park, if I may. I remember no, when the Josie, the one you have now, the Hot Springs National Park, I was working at Central High one day when we had a couple of uh, maintenance crew from Hot Springs up helping us out, and when they got the word that Josie was their new superintendent, and uh, they had had 18 years with Roger Giddings before, and he appeared in my doorway and he just looked stunned. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, what? What's up with you? I mean, did somebody run over your dog? What, what happened? And he said, we know who the new superintendent is. And I, I said, well, really, who? Josie Fernandez. She's a woman. 
And I kind of looked at him, and he, he must have realized who he was talking to, right? <laughs> so he didn't carry that thought any further out loud. But I thought to myself, well, good for you. Maybe we'll expand some horizons here. And by all accounts, Josie has completely won over her staff, and they love her. Uh, but I mean, that, that is an example of how on a local level, you know, things can be very different from, from the way they are on an organizational level. But, but overall, I have to say it, it has been a, a very supportive organization, and, and I've certainly benefited uh, from those who've come before me. Thank you, Spirit, for making me feel old. Um, <laughs> and I've been able to stand on the shoulders of all those who came before me, too, and so I, I thank all of them. Robin, if, before, uh, if I may, um, I'm very proud of those two guys. At least they were, they were able to read. Most people say I'm Jose Fernandez. <laughs> so, good for them, you know. Well, well, we all come from different places and our paths in different directions, but our experiences, are different and our needs are the same. So coming into this agency was challenging. Um, coming into the agency was also rewarding for me. And um, there was no fears. I am not afraid to go anywhere. So I feel that everywhere I go, I am part of the universe. And I was actually, I would say I was born in this agency starting at Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. So I've been with the agency almost 30 years. And um, just a little snot-nosed kid coming in actually in the field of maintenance and they sent me over to interpretation and I've been stuck there ever since. <laughs> but um, Indiana Dunes National Lake Show was the beginning. It was my foundation whereas I was immersed into both a, no a natural and cultural environment that was um, a blessing for me to actually be exposed to a different world and leaving there after 10 years and working in an urban environment and a natural environment and going to um, Petroglyph National Monument, leaving one culture and going into another culture. And I can't say who was there before me because I didn't know. I was pretty much on my own. And so I had to um, make my own way. And sometimes you have to do that. But the beauty of that is knowing who you are uh, and valuing your own self-worth and believing in yourself. So it was women in my community that invested in me, that had their hands on me, that prepared me to be where I am today, that invested in me because I believed in myself. So when people ask me, why are you going to Albuquerque, New Mexico? I said, because I can. And when I left Albuquerque, New Mexico, why are you going to um, Topeka, Kansas? Because I can. Why are you going to Grand Canyon? Because I can. Why are you going to South Africa? Because I can. Because everywhere I go, I'm part of the universe. And with that, I took with me my value, valuing my self-worth, and all the adversities that I encountered, all the challenges I encountered, I was prepared for that. And believe you me, there were some challenges, definitely. But I was prepared for that. And I ended up here. My first superintendency was um, leaving Grand Canyon as a district ranger supervisor for seven years. And then I was um, brought into a superintendency at um, William Iowa Taft National Historic Site. And from there, I was um, asked to come to Little Rock. And I'm happy to be here. I have wonderful staff, and I love working for them. OK? <laughs> Well, we'll open it up for uh, questions, and so if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Annie, I know you have one. You'll be first. Here it comes. Well, one of the things is I'm so proud to know all of y'all, and I have known you before you became the superintendent, and I feel like with you, Laura, I, I helped grow you. <laughs> but my question is that um, in America, I have watched people from all over the world come to the continental United States for our parks as one of the greatest tourist attractions of our country and our economy. I haven't had the privilege to truly examine 
the national park systems in other countries or continents. Could you share a little bit about that? I know that there has to be other countries that have their own national parks just because of the way the universe was created. Well, I, I can't say that I have extensively uh, traveled to other nations' national parks. I am familiar with uh, the Chilean parks. They're very well organized also in Italy and Canada. Um, I happen to have very good friends that I've made uh, um, in the Italian parks um, that have visited here, um, but I haven't had the opportunity to visit them. Um, the, the point to be made is that America's national parks are a, a model that is very much followed by others. Um, and the reason is that um, as a whole, and I, I hope that my colleagues agree that as a whole, America's national parks represent what is best about our natural and cultural resources. And, uh, and as a whole, the system attempts to, to uh, tell the American experience, the, the experience of people in the nation that we call America, uh, the United States of America, uh, and tell the entire story, warts and all. Um, pa Polly gave you an example of some of the parks that are um, in the system. I was very proud to be the superintendent at Women's Rights National Historical Park. Uh, that was the second park that I managed. And there the story is, it could be said that it's about women's history, and it certainly is. But um, I chose to view it as um, uh, about uh, the story for equality in citizenship for all of us who call ourselves citizens of this country. Um, Laura just happened to mention, you know, the little tidbit of or footnote in history that I've made. I happened to be the first woman superintendent at, at Springs National Park. Well, the place was established in 1832, and it took all of two, you know, all the way to 2004 for you know me to show up. I guess so. There were a lot of people that applied for the job. I can't say that I got the job, or I, actually I, I will say this, I hope that I didn't get the job because I'm a woman. I hope that I got the job because I was the best qualified person for the challenge that was um, evident for us to see in, in, in tackle, which was develop those darn bathhouses and open them to the public. And, you know, I would have voted for a monkey if the monkey would have, uh, you know, been able to pull that off. I, I've been able to pull a little bit of that off. So um, I guess I'm saying that because I, although certainly we can make a lot more progress as we move forward into, the, into uh, making the, the National Park Service a better agency and a more equal agency and a more fair agency and diverse agency, we shouldn't discount all the progress that we've made. And I don't want us to... Um, always think in terms of how many of this and how many of that and you know because it it just it it i think it's it could very well devalue uh, what we bring to the table if the only thing that you see when you look at me is the girl that is certainly today of all things you know <laughs> wearing a skirt wearing high heels and is, speaks with a bit of an accent and that would be a shame if that's all that we thought about when we look at these issues. I, just, I, I have seen some of the European parks. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I think it's really different about the national parks, about America's national parks. I think it's probably only been the last 20 or 30 years, but we have been willing to, sh to show our mistakes and make national parks about our mistakes, like Manzanar, for instance. Uh, like the this park, and I really think that was very courageous when they started to do that because before we were just saying, you know, look at all these beautiful places. And we've done to do we've done that. Now I know they're doing it a little bit in Germany. I don't know if it's national parks or if it's just in the in the uh, cities. They are doing things about that. I've seen the Norwegian parks, and they're just pretty pretty places. Uh, so every 
every uh, country has things that they would like to to that they're not proud of and i think when the park service got courageous enough to begin to develop these parks that makes me very proud of our country that we can do that responsibility um, to tell american story we're responsible um, for America's treasures. That's our history, good or bad, it's still our history. But at the same time, we are the facilitators. And as the facilitators, we don't own the stories. The story belongs to America. And that's the bottom line. These are your stories. This is your history. This is American history. Ready? Right oh, one second. I don't really have a question, but I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Kaufman knows that there uh, were two Japanese internment camps in southeast Arkansas. And there is restoration going on down there, mostly by the locals, but with some, with some uh, federal money as well. And so I will say to the group, anything that any of us can do to support those efforts, I'm sure would be greatly appreciated. There were there were actually ten, ten in all together. Right. Laura, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Like Andy, I kind of feel like I was a part of. You were. Well, but it was great, and I'm <laughs> proud of you. Um, and I think that is a fabulous thing, uh, the partnership that has turned into a national historic site at Hope. My question to you is this: um, We have honored Arkansas has a presidential library for Bill Clinton. There is a school uh, that bears his name. There is a birthplace that now is important. There is a place in Fayetteville called the Clinton House Museum. It was the place where the first lady came to Arkansas as a professor of law. It was the home where they married and the home where they lived. I would contend anywhere in the country, there's probably not a home where the President of the United States and the Secretary of State were married. So what would you recommend about the Clinton House Museum in the spirit of honoring women? Don't you think it's time Arkansas honored Hillary Rodham Clinton? Absolutely. And we so need to what talk would, to your congressman. <laughs> <laughs> or make it a state historic site or something, because the, this is a remarkable woman who was first lady of this state, who, who, who made a big difference. And, and there's a lot with the highest respect, and you know my friendship with both, but the highest respect, President Clinton's gotten a lot of honors here. Secretary of State Clinton has not. And uh, she made a big difference here. And particularly with four remarkable women sitting on this panel, I need your help. No, you're right, and, and I'm not being facetious. I mean, I, I think that one of the things I love about the, the whole story is there's so many different aspects of it. I mean, we can, we can be at the Clinton birthplace home and hope for years and years and years and talk about things that are completely different from what we talk about here at the library. I mean, there's a story about small town America and how that nurtures and sustains people to become who they are. I, I was thinking the other day because we're working on new exhibits. You know, Mr. Clinton's father died before he was born. And that's why his mother chose to stay in Hope and live with her parents and, and have him there. Otherwise, had he not died, she would have gone back to Chicago to have him and raise him in Chicago, away from family and friends, away from the grandparents, away from everybody. And, you, you know, as historians, you never want to play the wolf game because that... But you have to wonder, would he have been the same person had he not grown up in a small town in Arkansas? And I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I have to think that, that that background there changed him. And then the house in, in Fayetteville, you're right. It's a completely different aspect of his life. And again, in doing the exhibits, I mean, we could do a whole psychological study of the strong women in his life, from his grandmother, who took care of him when his mother had to leave to get her nurse anesthetist training, to his mother, who was a, a strong woman who took, held the family together despite all the adversity they had, and to you know marrying Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's just been a, a pretty amazing story, and, and I think there's a lot that we can tell. And you're absolutely right. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton was a huge part of our state's history for a long time, and um, I would certainly be supportive of seeing something to honor her and, and recognize her contributions here as well. 
Heath? I'd like oh. to add something about that. Uh, I have to say this to everybody. Uh, Time Magazine just had a wonderful cover story on her. And what she's doing now is trying to help the condition of women all over the world. Mm -hmm. It seems to be her major project. Uh, I really recommend that article about her. It's a, it certainly opened my mind. And Polly, the thing I would like to say is that, you know, she was first lady here. She lived many years here. She had a huge influence on education here. She had a huge influence on desegregation here. She married here, taught in the law school. It, 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 just, it just seems to me that that home, that place that people go visit, we, we, you know, I mean, we need women in leadership of national parks, and I support that. But we also need to make sure that the women who have done remarkable things are, are, are like Harriet Tubman and others. And certainly in Arkansas, there is a void here about Hillary Clinton, and there are four good minds up there. You guys can, you all can figure it out and help us. My name is Heath Kerlock. I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. I was a national park ranger in Texas at the LBJ National Historical Site. Um, and I have two visitors who sponsored me. Uh, I say they sponsored me. They were good for me while I was there. Uh, so thank you. Um, my question is for all of you, especially Laura. Uh, the transfer of authority. When you come onto the scene and you're a woman, um, did you find any friction uh, in that adjustment phase with the other employees in the Park Service? And could each of you share a part of your narrative in regards to that? Well, you know, it, one of the reasons that I was interested, um, part of the reason I was interested in taking the job at Clinton was an opportunity to start another national park. I've been very involved in the Central High um, uh, site ever since it was a nonprofit. In fact, I was the executive director of the nonprofit, and I made the transition into the National Park Service from there. So I'd already experienced that kind of transition from both sides of, of the table. And I kind of I understood very much what the foundation there and what the staff there were going through. Unfortunately, in our case, uh, we became a national park site and agreed to take donation of the property and agreed to assume operating the property in the absence of a spending bill from Congress that we do not have this year. As you all know, probably, we're operating under continuing resolutions, which keeps our funding at levels from last year. The problem for us was last year we were not a park. Okay? So that doesn't help us a whole lot. We're operating right now on funding from our regional office, uh, and it, it, I, couldn't, I cannot hire permanent staff at our site yet. So that meant we couldn't bring on any of the staff who were at the site. Now, the good news is they have found other positions, and they're all doing great. Uh, one of the interpreters got his dream job at Historic Washington State Park, and he also owns a cleaning company, and he's doing the cleaning for us. Um, you know, and, and so I think there's always, you, you know, you hate to see people lose their jobs, but they, they've all done, done well, and, and we're working with them. And everybody has been wonderfully supportive and, and very nice. Their goal was always to have this become a national park site, and so that's what they've been working for for almost 18 years now. Well, that's hard to believe it's been that long but about 18 years now, ever since Mr. Clinton was elected president. So, so they're happy to have us on board. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Heather? What am I going to say? Um, no. <laughs> um, my name is Heather Zabendon, and I started in 1999 as Laura Miller's intern. And I experienced part of the transition with her. But what I want to know is, you know, six of the nine are women. And I think that that's a very interesting statement for, Central, for the Central High story. How did you, being a woman, inform the interpretation? I mean, because the interpretation is vastly different from what it was at Museum Inc. I mean, it was... It was about the story moment by moment, and now it's much more of a bigger human rights story. So how did you, being a woman, inform that? Well, you know, at, at the mobile station, when we had the exhibits there, we had 700 square feet for exhibits. And so that, that sort of dictated what we could talk about. And, but given the 10 years experience or so that we had over there, we knew 
based on visitor feedback and things like that, what should go into the new exhibits. And, and I think, of course, being a woman influences that because I'm much, I, well, I'm aware of women's issues and I'm aware of, you know, sort of the, I don't even think you can talk about race without talking about gender because they intersect at so many different points and, uh, and they go hand in hand and on so many different levels. And it's, you know, it, it was reading the history of it and reading what people said about it, it was pretty clear why six of the nine were girls. You know, girls were less threatening than young black men, quite frankly, and, and that's part of the reason why so many of them were chosen. They also wanted students who were model students, made the perfect grades, were quiet, were, you know, and, and girls tend to fall into those categories even today. Um, and, and so that has, has it did influence the way we interpreted the story. And plus, there were other women's groups operating, obviously. There was a segregationist women's group operating. There was the Women's Emergency Committee that tried to get the schools reopened. And they had very different motivations and reasons. And within their groups, they had different levels of how really were the women involved and how were they really leading it. Uh, on the segregationist side, it was really the men who were, you know, driving the thing. They, but they knew enough about women's roles and, and expectations for women to put the women out front, you know, because it would be a softer message coming from mothers, right? Uh, and then, of course, Daisy Bates, you know, and the role she was able to play. I mean, she was able to get out there and say things that had Elsie Bates gone out and said them publicly, you know, he could have been hurt for it. And, but as a woman, she could get away with, with doing more. And it's not to say she didn't catch her share of, you know, all the flack that came out, but, but she could say things that I think a man couldn't, you know, couldn't have gotten away with saying at that point. Thank time, you for that question. We have time for one more. Um, yes, I was wondering if there has been a difference over the years between historic sites and natural heritage sites with acceptance of women. Since women were more accepted in historic home sites as custodians of the past, um, did that happen a lot in the National Park Service also? The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, women have typically been put in these small historic sites. Those were the sites that the women, a lot of the men, didn't want to do. And when I saw that Perry's Victory still has a woman superintendent, I remember the, one of the early women superintendents at Perry's Victory. And I thought, oh, they're, make, they're calling this a woman's park. I mean, a woman park superintendent. And it has been definitely a problem. These small historic parks have had women. Um, and having, you know, having a woman at Yellowstone was a big deal. Uh, she did recently retire. And the new uh, regional director, uh, Christine, I'm not sure I know, if I know her, uh, how to pronounce her name, it's something like Lynn Hertz, in the Pacific West was the deputy at Yellowstone. So she got terrific training. And so now she is the regional director there. So having a woman be superintendent of the uh, what do you call the premier parks, the big parks? That's a, that's a really big deal. And there are a lot of good historic parks, and it doesn't really bother me that women get those parks because in the first place, they can expand them and make them into really important places and tell larger stories. But it certainly is easier for a woman to be in a historic park than a natural park. that part of the trouble is that, it, it, at least in the case of Hot Springs, my predecessor was there for 25 years. So short of yes. kidnapping him or killing him, <laughs> you know, the, the vacancy was just not going to happen. So um, vacancies can only happen when people move on, retire, move on to some other job or die. And, uh, and so it is about having people prepared to jump at the opportunity. I would have never considered Hot Springs National Park as a destination for my next career had not my, one of my wonderful uh, bosses uh, mentioned that Roger was retiring and that career-wise I ought to take a look at leaving the Northeast and taking on a challenge at a natural, cultural, natural uh, national park. It would, this is my third assignment. I gave it a lot of thought. A lot of the stuff that you also have to consider when you're moving on is family and, 
in the career of your partner and where your kids are in, in the school. I, I brought kids that were nine and 10. I've been here for seven years. My firstborn is about to, to graduate and um, my second one is gonna be, is a junior now and a senior next year. So career-wise, uh, once my kids retire and there is an opportunity out there that my husband and I would want to explore, then that's the point that's the point when you jump but oftentimes those vacancies are just not there you might be ready to jump and you're the best person for whatever job but people ain't moving so the for the for Suzanne Lewis moving on and um, and her deputy moving to a, a regional director position that was caused by if you will an election uh, director, uh, Regional Director Jarvis was tagged to be the director of the National Park Service. There is a vacancy in San Francisco and everybody stood it, started moving uh, in a natural upward progression. Um, you go with the vision. If someone call you and offer you this position or you apply for this position, when you apply for it, you apply with an agenda, you apply with the vision, you're going there to make a difference, you're going there um, to have an impact with this national park site or national monument. And I've worked at all of them, national um, parks, national monuments, historic park, all of them. I've had experience at all of them. And you leave there with different experience. I'm, I'm a planner, so you get all the skills that you can to take you to the next level. But when you go, you go with the vision, knowing that this is not the end. This is a stepping stone. You're going to make a difference here. You're going to do something here incredible. And you're going to leave um, a group of agents of change here. And then you're going to go to the next level. Or you're going to go to the next site. But you plan your own destiny. They, they don't make decisions for you. You're making those plans yourself. And you all are working together. When I went to Cincinnati, that first year, I said, oh, I, I told Ernie, the regional director, I said, I got to go. And I told him, I, I want to go back home. I told him, I want to go back south. And I want to go to New Orleans. And he said, OK, give me two more years. I said, all right, I could do that. And I stayed there two more years. But while I was there, I invested in the community. I did my job while I was there. and. I received a call. I was in New York up and with some planning at the Manhattan sites. And I was in New York, and uh, the regional director called me, and he said, this site is open. Do you want it? He said, because it's as far south as we're letting you go. <laughs> so, and so I'm here. But I would not have taken it if I didn't think I could make a difference. I would not take it if I don't come in with a vision. So most of the time we move around, we have a purpose. Well, thank you all for sharing your insights.